Dungeons and Dragons will return after these messages. Holy hello, and goodly denizens of Internetlandia. My name is Jonathan Henry, and I am your ringmaster here at Giant Dragons. It had to be 1988 when my older brother got a subscription to Dragon Magazine. While his interest in the land of role-playing games quickly faded, here I am, 26 years later, still talking about it, on the internet no less. But that's kind of what I do. I talk all things gaming with the goodly people of Internetlandia. Tonight we have a really big show, as I'd like to walk through some of the advertisements that were intended to separate me from my money as a kid. Most specifically, I'd like to look at issue number 182 of Dragon Magazine. It's a great issue. First and foremost, it has this wonderful picture by Paul Jacques. It seems to be a great place for giant dragons to kick off its video series, as to cover one of my favorite giant dragons. The inside of the magazine does disappoint for adding more giant dragon goodness to your ADD 2nd edition game, with six dragons of Viking lore and spells for Dragonlands campaigns. But beyond the lure of the gaming articles are the gaming goodies. Today I can just hop on many of the thinking machines and communicate wirelessly with humans all over the world. But back in 1992, it was still 2400 baud, and if you wanted to know about a book, you had to read a magazine or find somebody who had bought the book. I had a good base of gamers, and about 70 or so of them would show up each Saturday for some around-the-table action. But the pages of Dragon Magazine promised us we were missing out. That if we only sent $2 to an address in California, we could receive a full-color catalog full of reviews. It was tempting and often tempting enough. Sadly, those catalogs have long since been used as drop cloth to spray minis and start fires. But the Dragon magazines have survived. All the moves across the pond and now rest comfortably in my living room next to what my sister likes to call the Bob Chair. Dark Sun was the newest of the settings for Dungeons & Dragons. It played large in past issues and filled a great deal of space in the pages of Dragon magazine over the past months. And TSR, the brains behind Dungeons & Dragons, were nothing if not self-promoters. They did so well, and the quality of their ads showed plainly in this issue. The eight pages dedicated to their new products, TSR was doing a fine job of keeping its market well informed, and they did so with a great deal of production value. The games looked really attractive back then, and I'm sure that a great many of good things we see here at one point in time found a spot around my gaming table. But in 1992, there was more to gaming than just D&D. But then, just as now, D&D attracts most of the attention. In my time as a gamer, I've gotten to play a great many games. Some of them were odd indie press pieces, but many of them I saw first on the pages of Dragon Magazine. For instance, it wouldn't be until 2013 that I would get to play Torg. It's a fantastic game, but I say that because I have a fantastic DM who's just in love with the system and has been since the 90s. It has been said that Torg, or the other role-playing game, flourished in a saturated market with game books, novels, and a slew of other books further talking about the cosmos. The next ad that really struck me is something that is very 1992 awesome. Most of you watching this are familiar with online dice rollers, but back in 1992, using a computer to roll dice was something that was not a great number of people did. For 40 bucks, you could have this whiz-bang toy. The Range 1 was an inspiration to budding computer users of the early 90s and in no time flat, my group was using an 8086 to replace dice. But that wasn't the only foray into the realm of thinking machines. The 1990s continued the long tradition of D&D on computers, of course, everybody's favorite popular video game and consoles. The computer was a great dungeon-crawling platform and made a good deal more sense to the masses than pen and paper at the time. As an infinitely more solitary style of gameplay, these games, while fun and all, seemed only good so far as they were recruiting tools. Kevin Simbeta was a big name in 1992, and his ads filled the pages of the magazine, extolling the British games magazine gamesman called Riffs, a classic among classics. One of the top 30 greatest games ever. But as we all know, Riffs is a topic of much charged emotion, so I shall digress. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 1990, and again in 1991, we as Americans were terrorized by the pop culture incarnations of these heroes on the half shell. They even sold audio cassettes at Pizza Hut, and I'm sure my playing it over and over as a kid is one of the many reasons there is a special place in hell for me. But the Palladium game held onto the original feel of the comic book, making it a darker, deadlier world full of oddball mutants carrying swords and machine guns with no regard for good old-fashioned law and order. 
It was, and is, fantastic. With loads of books in the series, you could pretty much take the fight to the Foot Clan anywhere on Earth or even space. As with all of the Palladium games, other than Recon, of course, they fit rather well together, and pulling a wizard into the future or a teenage mutant ninja what have you into the past was rather painless. But the future belonged to Robotech. As a kid, I was a bit of a Harmony Gold Robotechaholic. I had pictures of Rick Hunter and Lisa Hayes at their wedding on my wall and spent an unusual amount of time planning huge robot battles. But this trip down memory lane brings up SDC versus MDC, so maybe we just better leave it at that. The pages of this and every other issue of Dragon Magazine also gives hints to faraway bastions of gamery goodness. Around the time of this issue, I was hitting the streets of jolly old London town in the search for the orcs nest. It turned out to be a small hole in the wall that was jam-packed with books galore. I remember buying a t-shirt, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, and David Brin's Uplink curves. These adverts and others in the Gamer's Guide really lit my imagination as much as the articles. The various bits of oddity that you could add to your games, minis you could make, dungeons of the month clubs, learn to craft chainmail, buy mail, and it all gets wrapped up with a nice PSA about going outside to play. Thank you very much for spending your time with me today, and I hope you enjoyed a quick look at issue 182 of Dragon Magazine. Hopefully in the future we'll do uh, more reviews of Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine. Until that time, remember to have an airborne kind of day. Thank you very much for watching. This has been Jonathan Henry for Giant Dragons.